willing to take any chances here. They were very angry when Daniel Harris and Brandon Caserta were acquitted at the first trial, the federal trial. That upset them and they said, hey, for this retrial of Adam and Barry, we're really going to control everything. You know, we're going to basically make a kangaroo court, which is what they did, where they controlled everything. Um, and so, you know, it, it, yes, they would go to this length to shut down a documentary. <laughs> it's not crazy to think that. So that's where we stand right now. We have the government trying to shut down my documentary basically by making it impossible for me to continue my interviews with Adam and Barry. Uh, but uh, unfortunately for the FBI, I'm still going to finish the documentary and I'm still going to expose them. Earlier today, Attorney General Dana Nessel was joined by officials from the Department of Justice and the FBI to announce state and federal charges against 13 members of two militia groups who are preparing to kidnap and possibly kill me. We're grateful to the FBI and law enforcement to discover these domestic terrorists and stop them. You know, it's the sort of behavior you might expect from ISIS. You might see a number that high in a sprawling narcotics conspiracy that stretches from coast to coast and beyond. That's a pretty high number in a case like this. It really reflects, I think, how deeply the government has been diving uh, into this investigation to try to make these cases. It was just literally a bunch of working class guys who on the weekend got together and you know, exercise their rights and train with firearms. So the FBI says, hey, we'll just pay for everything. Who arranged the meeting? The FBI's paid provocateur. Robeson was getting paid to set this stuff up. So they make the route, they set the locations, they make the plan, they do everything, and Adam's literally just sitting in the basement of the vacuum repair shop smoking blunts all day. You're gonna hear that my client was the leader of this group. But I think you're also gonna hear that there was an election held to identify the leader, and it was Dan. How can I frame a social situation to make this naive person appear to be a dangerous, violent terrorist? The whole goal was for the FBI to spend millions of dollars to create militia groups, record them saying offensive stuff, and then frame them in a fake conspiracy. What's up, everybody? Uh, as you know, I am currently working on a documentary on the uh, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping plot, whatever you want to call it. Um, I've been reporting on the story for two years and uh, I have been working on a documentary about it for a while now. Um, I will have uh, included in the video description a bunch of links for where you can go to follow the documentary, all of the official social media, the website for the film, um, but I just wanted to give everybody an update. So I'm going to be playing a clip here. This is uh, an interview I did with um, independent journalist Ken Silva, who has reported on the Whitmer case as well, and Brandon Caserta, who I am working with on the documentary. He was one of the defendants in the federal case who was completely acquitted by a jury. I am here with Ken Silva. He's an independent journalist who has covered the Whitmer case. And Brandon, you guys know Brandon. Um, you've seen him on the channel before. I've interviewed Brandon, and obviously he was one of the defendants in this case who was acquitted. And obviously Brandon and I are working on the documentary together. And, um, you know, I had been interviewing Adam and Barry for the documentary for uh, a while, I mean, I was spoke to Barry for probably um, several weeks, maybe a month um, altogether. I didn't get as much time uh, with Adam. I didn't start speaking to Adam until after his sentencing. Uh, his lawyer had advised him not to talk to anybody, not to talk to any media. Um, he was aware of the documentary and that I was... Uh, 
filming for it, but he hadn't talked to me. So Barry had been speaking to me prior to that, prior to his sentencing for the documentary. And, um, you know, it was very obvious that there, they were upset about the documentary, uh, the government, um, you know, at Barry's sentencing, they said all kinds of really weird things about him. They called him the spiritual leader of the group, which was a bizarre thing to say because they hadn't really made that claim uh, during the entire trial and retrial. It just seemed at Barry's sentencing that they were upset with him. And then they were saying, well, he was actually the real ringleader, not Adam, who we have been saying was the ringleader for the past two years. Now we're going to say it's Barry. Barry's the real ringleader and Barry got more time in prison than Adam. Uh, Barry was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Adam got 16 years. And uh, they referenced part of the in one of the interviews I had done with Barry at his sentencing. So it's obvious that they are aware that he was doing interviews and stuff like that. And then uh, one of the last, the last time I spoke with Barry, the last thing that we did was record a statement that he wanted to make to the uh, weaponization subcommittee. Um, and so that was that. And I had gotten a little bit uh, from Adam about what he wanted to say to the committee. Um, and then as soon as we put out Barry's, um, his statement, I, I could just published it on my YouTube channel. It seemed like the next day, these guys were being moved to Supermax prisons. And, um, you know, they're, they're no longer, they're effectively no longer going to be able to participate in the documentary. So Ken, you've done some research into the prisons uh, that Adam and Barry are going to, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that you think it was the next day after you published their videos on your YouTube channel, and it, indeed it was the very next day, I believe. Or you might have published it on Sunday. I picked it up and did a story on it Monday. On Tuesday, they were in vans headed to the Supermax facilities, and Adam's mom told me that they were put in separate cages and separate bands, treated kind of like Hannibal Lecter, like treating them like literal psychopaths. Uh, they were spirited to a facility in Oklahoma. Uh, Adam was held there for about a day or two. And then he was transferred up to Florence Supermax, which your viewers and listeners might know is one of the most notorious prisons in the world. It's the home of um, El Chapo, uh, one of the Oklahoma City bombers. Uh, it used to be the home to the Unabomber. I think he aged out of the facility now, but uh, it, it's there's serious human rights abuses at this facility. It's um, one of the reasons they didn't extradite Julian Assange is because the UK deems this floor and supermax place, um, you know, a human rights abomination that their government wouldn't send anybody to. And, you know, you guys know Adam Fox better than I do. He, he seems like a really harmless kind of teddy bear, gullible type guy. And, and the fact that they'd throw somebody like Adam there is a, unconscionable. I mean, he needed to be probably like rehabilitated, get off the weed, go to some classes, hopefully, you know, be in a mid mid tier prison where he could hopefully come out on the other end better. And now that that's just probably no chance of that. Yeah, I mean, Adam uh, had no criminal record prior to any of this. He's never been in trouble before. He's never been in jail before, certainly never been in prison before prior to any of this. And he, you know, has been at Nuego County. And it's, you know, there are other things going on at the same time, you know, so we're, we were working on the documentary, but we also have an, an ongoing state case with five other defendants. Um, so, and they all interconnect, you know, at the state case for um, uh, Joe Morrison, Pete Musico, Paul Bellar, they reference, of course, the federal case. And they're mentioning both that first state case in the federal case in this second state case. So they're all connected to one another. And um, the 
attorney general in Michigan is trying to keep all of the information on that sealed, which is, it's very interesting. You know, if there's all this evidence that these guys were helping to conspire to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer, we'd have all this evidence of it and you'd want people to see that. Um, but no, it's just like, with the federal case, how a lot of that information is still under seal and has not been released despite that case being over. Um, it seems like there's, you know, information they don't want people to see and they kind of want to control everything just like they did in the first uh, trial in the federal case and especially in the second trial. And Barry, he is also very, uh, he, you know, he's a... Um, I think he's almost in his 50s now. He's, you know, an older guy. I mean, he, I don't think he's really been in trouble before that, you know, he had some things when he was younger, uh, you know, very young. And other than that, you know, he's been a father raising his three daughters. So he, he's certainly not a violent person. Uh, it's just kind of crazy to put these guys in these supermax facilities and prevent them from communicating with members of the public. Yeah, and I did hear from Barry's mom. She told me two days ago that they had she had a brief conversation with Barry. He says it's, quote, 10 times harder than the prison in Michigan. Uh, that's to be expected. He's still being kept in isolation. And his mother says, no doubt, uh, to keep him from communicating uh, to the outside and to the weaponization committee. So, you know, the family has the same suspicions as we do that they're, they're really trying to shut these guys up. Yeah. I mean, Barry would say to me, you know, when we were filming, like he would tell me all the time to uh, be careful and things like that. And I thought, oh, Barry's just being paranoid and stuff. And he would say things that I thought were kind of weird about, like, they're going to try to silence me and stuff. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, but I'm a lot, you know, they're letting me talk to him uh, and participate in the documentary. So I thought he was just kind of being paranoid, which is under understandable if you're in prison. But yeah, it, it seemed like he was correct. And I think that what happened is once again, you have this sort of like the issue that they've always had with this case, which is that anytime somebody really starts looking at it, and focusing on the details, it falls apart very easy. It's not difficult to, in many different ways, pull apart the narrative here. So it seems like while they're both appealing too, I mean, I, I don't really know, admittedly, I'm not uh, an expert on how the prison system works, but Adam and Barry are both appealing. So I thought it was strange to move them out now when they've been in Nuego for a while and now they have their appeals going like why would they need to be moved right now what would be the purpose of that if they're appealing their case why not keep them at Nuego County or move them to just like a, a similar facility closer to their families it just doesn't make sense to put them in these prisons that are really for violent criminals and none of these guys at the end of the day committed a crime, certainly not a violent crime. So it's very disturbing. It does seem like, you know, the goal is to prevent them from being able to participate in the documentary. One of the things that Barry and I had been doing is he had sent me some papers, um, stuff he'd gotten during the discovery process uh, that he sent to me. And we were going through sort of the indictment and just like line by line going through what the different allegations of the government were. And he was saying, you know, this is how this isn't true, blah, blah, blah. So he was taking notes on that. And that's, um, you know, that's a shame that uh, now he's not going to be able to do that because he also had been working on a manuscript for a book he wanted to write, basically telling his story that was confiscated by the prison. And we don't, I don't know if we know what's going to happen to that stuff. I mean, I know that they said that there was uh, transcripts that he's having sent to me. So I'm hoping that uh, his belongings are in there as well. I know Adam's mom did receive his belongings because she told me she found a letter that names the new appeal attorney for Adam. So I would hope that 
maybe Barry's mom might have that transcript because, yeah, that seems like a valuable document to uh, to get out to the public. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's just, you know, it's very uh, it's upsetting to me. I don't see why they need to be in harsher conditions than they've been in the past two years. Like what has changed where they now are not going to be able to communicate in the same way. You know, Barry was able to send me his handwritten notes on his legal paperwork here. And now if he's moved, I don't think he's going to have the same ability to do that. So it's unfortunate, but um, you know, it is what it is, <laughs> I guess. We're really, um, you know, my last conversations, my last few conversations with Barry, we were talking about what he anticipated happening with the appeals process and how long he thought that was going to take. He thought that could take years and he didn't really have hope in that process. Um, you know, he has, he has talked about the the way that the legal system, <laughs> how they controlled everything with the first trial, the second trial was even worse. And it was so obvious that there was, um, you know, serious interference on behalf of the federal government there by Judge Jonker. So he doesn't really have much faith in the appeals process, but he, he's got a new lawyer for that. And that lawyer is not very familiar with his case. He's going to have to become familiar with it as he represents Barry. So, you know, it's just the timing of all of this, right as Barry's getting a new lawyer, now he's moved into these conditions. And, you know, I just kind of ask myself not to say anything negative, of course, about any of the lawyers um, in the case, but like, why hasn't uh, something, you know, why haven't the lawyers like talked about this stuff on you know, any media outlet, I'm sure would interview them and have them on. Like, why aren't they saying, hey, you know, uh, we had really questionable things happen in this trial, in the retrial. My clients are appealing and now they're being totally silenced. They're being sent to supermax facilities. You know, it, it's just very, um, it's scary. You know, it, it seems like there, there really isn't much hope for them. It, pursuing this through the legal system. And it does, you know, Barry said that he thought the documentary was going to be, you know, his only hope or his last hope. And now, of course, they're trying to make that more difficult. So that's great. Um, but Brandon, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you were in Nuego County, you were around Adam and Barry. Uh, you know, what do you, what do you think about all of this? Yeah, well, uh, what's interesting to me is, you know, being in Nuego for 18 months, you see a lot of people come in and out, right? You see people that, you know, go to their sentencing hearings and get sentenced. And a lot of these people have a, a violent uh, past and, you know, maybe the, the crime that they took a plea to or got convicted for was, you know, a heavy sentence, like 20 years, 25 years. They got a rap sheet of like 10 other different felonies and, the judge is supposed to look at your sentencing guidelines and say, you know, it's not like a willy nilly choice. I mean, they can do that if they want, but they're supposed to look at the sentencing guidelines based off your criminal history and whether the crime was actually violent and stuff like that. Like conspiracy crimes aren't violence. You know what I'm saying? It's not like a violent crime. And, you know, I've seen people walk in and out that, they would, uh, you know, they would have some homeboys already in there and then they would come in or whatever, then they would get sentenced then they would ride out to prison. And then their homeboy who's still in our cell, you know, would call him and talk to him or talk to one of his people and they tell him where they were at and everything like that. And uh, I mean, you would have people in low security, medium security prisons that had a huge criminal history. You know what I mean? And the judge is supposed to look at that and say, okay, well, you don't have any past history in crime. So, you know, by law or integrity or whatever you want to call it, right, I'm not supposed to send you to some super max crazy, you know, secure place because you're not like a flight risk. Right? Yeah, I should mention, though, that the government, unfortunately, does have a demonstrated track record of doing this. There's nothing really anomalous about what they did to Adam or Barry. Uh, there's a bunch of political prisoners in supermax facilities. Uh, Florence, 
not maybe not as much, but it, the, there's a Supermax in Terre Haute, which I, I understand is where they might send Barry, where they have like uh, some libertarian hacktivists locked up. I think the drone whistleblower Daniel Hale is there. Uh, a bunch of people who aren't necessarily violent, but do have very damaging and embarrassing things to say about the government. Yeah, precisely. Um, I don't think it's kind of crazy to suggest that what's happening to them uh, with being sent to Supermax uh, is retaliatory. I mean, I believe that what happened to Barry at his sentencing was retaliatory because it was shocking. And it was stunning to me that they would say some of the things that they said, you know, Barry asked that I obtain the transcript from his sentencing hearing and just put it up on a website where people can go and just look at it and see what the U.S. attorney said there, what Nils Kessler said um, about the Constitution and just kind of the ridiculous stuff that they that they still claim. I mean, in the state case, uh, I was looking at it. Uh, Ken, you were looking at this too. In the state case, they have their judge um, who, this is the five, uh, the second state case with five other guys that they're trying to seal all of the uh, documents for. Um, and they're saying like, is undeniable, undisputable fact that uh, this conspiracy in fact did happen. And Brandon, they're like they're still defaming you. You were acquitted and they include you in there though and say that you were part of this conspiracy that they it has been like verified, right? Is is not in question that this was a thing. And it's just to me, you know, it's very interesting. I would think that I would assume that this would be like a pretty big story. You know, it's a big case. Like when if you're going to allege like the biggest domestic terror case in a generation, like that should be a big story. People should be interested to see like what the actual evidence for this is, because there's a lot of implications, you know, surrounding this that will affect other people, especially like the right that people have to participate in militia groups if they so choose to. You know, they the Michigan case, it seems like they want to criminalize things like that. The sort of guilt by association, like, oh, you you could be guilty of providing material support for terrorism if you participate in this completely lawful activity, and then we frame somebody down the line. And they kept calling them gangs and stuff. But yeah, what do you make of that, that they're still saying this? Like the government just, they maintain this narrative that like, this is what we say happened. Yes, this evidence came out. Yes, a jury rebuked us and they acquitted two people. But we're still going to say that this was a thing. And we're still going to say that they participated in this conspiracy. Like they're outright saying that in this state case. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, the, like, look at all the trials that have been going on, especially recently. It's all storytelling. You know what I mean? It's all, th there's not any legitimate, you know, criminal activity happening. It's it's all political. You know what I mean? It, it's, and they're, the, the mainstream media and everything is pumping out all that propaganda to try to feed into people's minds to get them to believe, you know, what the government's saying. And this is also because like they're losing, right? Like people like us are winning and and with logic and reaching more people and more people want to listen to stuff like this than watch like, you know, the communist news network, right? So they have to try as many different ways as they can to make their story fit. And what's crazy is, I mean, they changed their story so many different times in our trial you know, and in pretty much every single trial that had happened in this case. And it's weird because, you know, when we got arrested and we're talking to our attorneys and stuff like that, <clears throat> even after everything happened, you know, we, we've always kind of said like, dude, they're targeting us. Like, you got to be careful. You know what I mean? And the attorneys know that now, like, and they realize it, but instead they're like, yeah, we're just going to kind of take a step back. Like, I don't want to lose my license. I don't want to, like, get in trouble. Yeah, like, they're, pretty nice they're line, paranoid. You know? <laughs> right, right. They're paranoid, bro, because they, 
right, they finally realize, oh, shit, the government is a tyranny. You know what I mean? And if I speak out against it, they're going to come after me in some way. And they understand the legal system is corrupt, too. You know, but it's this that's what they try to do is they just try to maintain the story the best that they can and act like two people didn't totally just get acquitted in the first trial. You know what I mean? Let's just act like that never happened. Let's not even talk about it. Let's just keep saying they were in it, right? They were involved in it. Well, uh, not really, bro, because I'm out free right now. I got all my stuff back, dude. What are you talking about? You know, I wasn't yeah. involved in this. That's what the jury said. Don't you guys respect the decisions of juries? You know, oh, well, not when it's not in their favor, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's the most amazing part about this, I think, is just how much they have completely just try to maintain that narrative. Um, you know, it's kind of shocking to me. And this is why I think it is so important and why people should be paying attention to it. And I, you know, people have asked me like, you know, why have you spent so much time on this case? Why is it so important to you? Well, it's important because that is a huge allegation. You know, if you're claiming that a militia group was conspiring to kidnap a governor, storm state capitals and do all this bullshit it's like okay so let's see you know this evidence that's a big allegation yeah and yeah. the victim of the case is a democratic governor so it's obviously political right uh <laughs> and um you know she ha has made victim impact statements she did i heard her you know they played a three minute long at the state case for Bellar Musico and Morrison, they played this three minute video of Whitmer making this statement that she had produced where she talked about how she's a victim. She talked about how basically she lives her life differently now. Anytime she's going to an event, she's got to beef up the security or now she has to run through scenarios in her head. Like this is the kind of stuff she said. And she basically told the judge that, they need to send a message to these people and that this was about upholding our sacred democracy. These people invoke January 6th. Dadamani, the prosecutor, in that state case, she went on a tirade about lone wolf shooters and how all of this is like jihadi hate camps and just this insane stuff. But it's like, how do you have a fair trial when the stakes are that big you're making this massive allegation and then the victim is a political is a political figure you know and Gretchen Whitmer is somebody who you know in my eyes was being groomed to run for higher office somebody like a Gavin Newsom in the Democrat party so she's you know now going and speaking at the World Economic Forum you know she's talking about gun violence and all of this uh, silly stuff. So for her uh, to give these statements, like how are these judges supposed to operate independently, right? With no bias or whatever, that's the governor of their state that is telling them like, you need to send these guys a message with sentencing or whatever. And so it just seemed to me that the whole thing was very corrupt and that you would need to have somebody, you know, kind of looking at things, you know, someone watching how this played out and you would want more transparency for the public to see that there isn't any, you know, egregious FBI misconduct that's been hidden or covered up or anything like that. Um, yeah, you know what they should do? Congress should form a committee or something, you know? <laughs> like to investigate these yeah. kinds of things. God forbid. Yeah. Right here, here's the perfect example of it, the perfect case of the weaponization of the federal government against a group of innocent people where they can't keep their story straight. And it's obvious that they've interfered on many levels uh, to the point of witness tampering, witness intimidation. Um, that was obvious. The media saw it happen. Everybody just sits here watching this stuff happen and no one does anything about it. You know, the media who sat there for two years as the government proclaimed Adam Fox, the homeless man living in the basement of the Vac Shack, is the ringleader of this uh, domestic terrorist group. And then at sentencing, after they sentence him, they bring in Barry and they're like, oh, Nope, he's the ringleader. Forget what we just said. He's actually worse than Adam. Sentence him for more time. And it's like, 
No one questions this stuff. Nobody says anything. And I think that's terrifying. You know, I think that it's the kind of thing that is very scary. It could happen to anybody, um, really. And that is why it's important, important. And that's why everybody should be following it. And it's why we have to finish the documentary. Um, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to meet my time frame of having it done by the end of this year. Hopefully I will. But uh, in any case, um, you know, anytime they do stuff like this, it just shows you how kind of pathetic they are, though, that they are so desperate to keep the scam going and to keep the, this false narrative out there about the FBI, you know, being the world's premier law enforcement agency. Nobody believes that anymore. I don't think on either side, the left or right, you know, there was a an article that just came out uh, in The Intercept. Um, it was written by Trevor Aronson, the guy that wrote The Terror Factory, and, and he was talking about, it, it almost mirrored the Whitmer case, but it was a, a, a criminal, career criminal informant that had infiltrated like BLM Denver. And it, it is very similar to somebody like Steve Robeson, I guess, minus the pedophile part, but you know, so this is something that's happening to both sides, regardless, like it's clearly a problem, you know, uh, but I just thought that was interesting too. the timing of that story breaking, like right before the weaponization committee starts looking into like cl the clearly like politicized nature of the FBI that they come up with like the one time that they infiltrated a leftist organization like oh no we do this to the left too <laughs> well, there there are democrats sitting on that weaponization committee that suppose they're supposed to investigate the fbi and it seems like a real no-brainer real low-hanging fruit for the republicans and democrats to strike a deal hey we'll investigate the fbi infiltrating left-wing groups like black lives matter in exchange for investigating the FBI's infiltration of right-wing groups. Yeah, like, this seems like no brainer, but instead at the first committee hearing, you had the ranking Democratic member say like literally, thank God for the FBI. Without the FBI, this country would fall into chaos. And she cited some recent neo-Nazi plot to knock out the power grid in Baltimore or something, something that also is probably a Fed plot. So there was an, an FBI informant in that one too. So like- <laughs> <laughs> of so course, these, these are the kind of people that you know we're kind of relying on to get to the bottom of this, and it doesn't really inspire a lot of hope. No, it doesn't, and I think that that's one of the things I've learned the most going through this process, trying to make the documentary, engaging in the system, is that the entire thing is just so corrupt. Um, it is. It's very sad. It's very disappointing. And then everybody that you think that you're supposed to turn to for help disappoints you also. Uh, all of these politicians that are supposed to be representing the people, you know, they're more interested in talking about the latest thing with Hunter Biden, you know. And uh, so I think that we have to just kind of continue to talk about it and report on it because that's probably the best chance these guys have of getting any kind of justice or anybody looking into their treatment. And with January 6th, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, honestly. You've had people held in pretrial detention uh, in also very horrible, harsh conditions, and nothing's been done about that. <laughs> So here we are in 2023, and a lot of these people have not been able to see any of their discovery material. They're hardly having any communications with their lawyers. They're certainly uh, not getting uh, private communication with their lawyers. I mean, that's not happening at these facilities, DC, Gitmo. Um, so it, and it's impossible for them to get fair trials in DC with a DC jury. It's very sad, um, but... I guess this is where we're at right now. So I think, you know, the only thing we can do, the only way that we can fight back against it is to just expose these people, work harder to get the documentary done and get it out there. And then that's it. That's all you can do, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, do you guys have anything else you want to add? Well, if, if I have a minute, I actually did have one quick yeah. question for Brandon about this whole 
trove of discovery material that hasn't been made public yet. Um, so can you explain to me exactly what documents aren't public? Because some of the stuff that was reported on by BuzzFeed in 2021, is that now sealed and that you originally gave it and now it's not available? Because not all of that was, you know, revealed in trial. Yeah. So, you know, kind of what happened in the beginning, as far as I know, when the government said, hey, we arrested these guys, this is the crime and all of the stuff, the, the prosecution can let out information, you know what I mean? And they, they kind of chose certain things um, that they like either couldn't hide or maybe they messed up or the, that's the story they were trying to tell. And I think the judge like made a ruling um, before our trial started, the first one, uh, whether or not like certain pictures of Barry could come up and stuff like that. Um, but other than that, there's a massive amount of information that nobody knows about. And, you know, we're talking so many different audio files, um, pictures of like people's property, uh, drone footage, um, you know, video footage, training footage, like, you can, there's video evidence. You see Dan Chappell literally training us for hours. You know what I mean? Like he's literally directing everything and doing everything. And then you could go, okay, where's this timestamp in this video? Okay. It's around this time. Let's go check the audio. Oh wait, who's he talking to right there? Oh, he's talking to Steve Robeson right after this. And he's telling Steve to go over here and do that. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's so obvious that they coordinated the whole thing. Um, but they want to keep that stuff sealed so that the truth doesn't come out. They have to maintain uh, their story. They're sick that I'm out free. You know, they thought that they could get me. They thought they could get me and Dan, they wanted to. And they were like, Oh my God, I can't believe it. You know what I mean? We got to hurry up and try to get something to make this look real, you know, because our story's falling apart, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, Oh, and there's so many text messages. Um, They got like, so everyone that was charged, I mean, they got all your Facebook messages, all that stuff, dude, everything. And it's like, you see other communication, like through Facebook and stuff like that, that, you know, wasn't in the chat room. Um, there's just, there's so much stuff. And that's part of the reason that was part of their tactic too, is, Hey, we're just going to drop a bunch of stuff on you guys and make you sit in jail while you're trying to fight it and hope that you take a plea and then overload these attorneys and make it all disorganized and all this stuff um, to just make it harder and harder to fight for your freedom. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Sorry for sidetracking the broadcast with that kind of technical question, but I think it's just important because, you know, Barry and Adam are calling for the weaponization committee to subpoena all the discovery material yeah. And, you know, I want to give people a sense for what exactly hasn't been made public yet. And it seems like it seems like there's a whole crime scene in those records. And it's not it's not the Wolverine yeah. Watchmen's crimes. It's the FBI. Right. There's uh, you know, and there's even FBI reports as well. Like, OK, when did they first start kind of looking at Barry? Right. Well, when they look at someone, they have to write a report on it and and make it make sense. And. They're talking about, uh, you know, an informant contacted them and let them know that, you know, Barry was concealing a firearm and he had a firearm and stuff like that. And, you know, then they looked at his Facebook and was like, whoa, you know, we need to look into this guy. I mean, the dude uh, legally, um, you know, resolved his issue and got his gun rights back. Yeah. And that's what was happening. Like, you're telling me, like, you have to get approval for that, right? So you're telling me that the feds didn't know that, okay, this guy just, you know, took care of the situation, got his firearm back legally or, you know, his right, whatever. And there's no reason to investigate him because what he's doing is not illegal, you yeah. know, and just stuff like yeah. that. Right. Yeah, there's, a, you know, I think that what they have hidden is all of the evidence that disproves their narrative because what they allege simply isn't true. And I don't think it's even possible. You know, I think there were times, you know, at, at trial that they claimed people were at certain events 
that they weren't there, like that they weren't at. Brandon, that happened to you. They said that you were at some meeting or something with, with some group. You're not on the audio, but they said that you're there like nodding your head or something. And you were able to show that like you weren't even there, that you were at work or something. <laughs> and it was just like, this is insane. Like this is nuts, you know? And I'm sure there's so many other things like that. I mean, where you could just kind of pull this thing apart and just see that how at every step of the way, none of this happens without the active participation of the FBI. I think most importantly, though, what the committee should look into is obtaining the communications of the confidential human sources, the CHSs, the informants who were really pushing this thing. I mean, the FBI admits that in their own uh, file for uh, for Steve Robeson, they say that he was engaging in that kind of behavior. So, you know, that's another interesting aspect to this whole thing. Uh, yeah. They admonish like their own CHSs for steering uh, the investigation. And then they say, oh, no, we didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and and what they did was they prevent him from being able to, to take the stand at all. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing they did with Steve Robeson is they gave him what was uh, called um, OI or yeah, OIA, otherwise illegal activity. So that's an approval to do illegal stuff by the FBI. And he was already doing that. They found out about it, you know, and they're like, dude, come on, man. Like, what are you doing? You know, okay, we got to give him OIA now. You know what I mean? And they were giving him that after he was doing this stuff. So they knew about the illegal things that he was doing without their approval or them directing him to do it, you know, and then just like figuring out how to get the approval afterwards. You know what I'm saying? And just yeah. like shady stuff like that too is, is all in the discovery. I mean, there's so much, any logical person could look at the discovery and realize that it's totally an FBI created fake terrorist plot. I mean, you know they I'm say saying? they say as much themselves. Like there are text messages between FBI agents and their informants where the FBI is specifically telling them to bring certain people into the plot or they're saying what the plot is. Like, you know, a uh, plan is to <laughs> kill the governor specifically, you know, Frank Butler. Um there's a, a lot, though, and I think that that's what they don't want people to see. They don't want people to see how big this was, how many different people were under surveillance, how many different field offices were involved, because then you start looking into that and then you start asking, well, who's overseeing this stuff? Who at the FBI is coordinating between the various field offices? You've got various FBI agents. They're all running different informants. And um, they're obviously coordinating that, you know, the government says that the informants weren't aware of each other, so they weren't coordinating with each other, but they very clearly are. You can also see that in the government's own paperwork, um, in the uh, out-of-court statements that uh, came through Discovery. But unfortunately, the jury wasn't able to see where you can just outright see like they have audio transcripts from things that were picked up on a wire where Steve Robeson is, you know, calling a meeting to attention or suggesting uh, overt violence and telling people that they need to come up with the plan and they're wasting his time. It is always the government uh, making these kinds of statements and that is very clearly in there. And so I think that they just don't want people to really look into how big it was because it clearly goes back a little bit longer than they initially said uh, with their plan to, you know, infiltrate the Midwest militia groups. Steve Robeson's creation of a, a nationwide fake militia group, the FBI administering uh, these groups on Facebook. I think that that's really, they, they don't want people seeing how big of an operation they have going here against the American people and asking questions about, you know, the how they're running the CHS program, which apparently is spending millions of dollars and using career criminals. You know, I don't think that any of these, like I would question all of these cases the FBI has worked on. And of course, the one that you were talking about, the Democrats citing uh, this most recent one, talking about the power stations, the, the people involved in that were 
associated with the Adam Waffen group, which was a group that was infiltrated by the FBI. And the FBI tried to steer them into uh, Satanism, pedophilia, and stuff like that, like the occult. Um, very crazy story there. They had a guy that the FBI was paying this informant. He, he's been apparently an informant since like 2003. They were paying him to publish a satanic neo-Nazi propaganda uh, through a publishing outlet called Martinet Press that the FBI was like silent partners in publishing books that encouraged uh, culling and again, like pedophilia and occult rituals. So this is what the FBI does. And like people don't understand that. They need to be aware of that. The FBI was paying for those books to be written and published. Like, so they're creating the the threat that they say is this big threat, right? Like this white supremacy, neo-Nazi, blah, blah, blah. They're publishing at the same time, they're saying there's this big neo-Nazi threat, you know, domestic terrorism threat. They're publishing neo-Nazi propaganda literature, distributing it, infiltrating groups, creating groups, trying to radicalize people like that. You know, the Adam Waffen group had these young kids that were like 17 years old and they had this informant that was getting them drunk, giving them drugs and doing like brainwashing techniques on them you know it's just nuts <laughs> uh it's crazy and this is what the fbi does though and they continue to get away with it so it shouldn't be nothing they do should be surprising to anyone anymore but you know it is what it is i mean he, he did if 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 and a big if here i'm just gonna say this if we were really guilty the government wouldn't have to lie and that's all they did from the time of the criminal complaint on with this entire case. Like nothing yeah. in there between their criminal complaint and their indictment, nothing is consistent. After my mom left, you know, I kind of was like, I was alone, you know, and so and I had like, you know, I have a, I have a very patriotic heart, you know, like I love my country, I love the Constitution, I love the the prince of the principles of freedom, and the right, you know, to to the pursuit of happiness, and so that's when I like kind of found this Michigan Home Guard online. I kind of you know ended up joining them and went to a few trains with them, and it was kind of like a place to belong, you know. So that's what kind of really got me started in the militia movement. Yeah, a lot of anger. You know, I, I, I dealt, you know, a lot of years. I still deal with, you know, depression and anxiety. It runs in my family. And so I can, looking back, you know, I can see kind of like why I would be an easy target for the government. Yeah. You know? and so, like, yeah. <laughs> but the, the government's whole narrative is wrong with that meeting. You know, like people have expressed their concerns. No one talked about kidnapping anyone. We, we left that meeting. First off, that meeting, the idea of storming the Capitol was shot down yet again even though it was reintroduced by Dan Chapel at the next Munith training at Joe and Pete's house. But we left that meeting. Jim McIntosh was at that meeting. He's the one telling us, oh, you know, you can do a, a citizen's arrest. You know, you need a, a constitutional sheriff and a judge. They can issue a blanket warrant and they can take their own men. They can even deputize men and then they can go serve it, you know. So that's what we left that meeting with the premises. And that's why I followed up on that. You know, and like I said, that the sheriff Dan Abbott of Van Buren County was willing to meet with me. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's asterisks at a place, I believe, on page 14, 16, or 18. Um, it'll be an item that has Special Agent Impola and Special Agent Chambers in the recording. Okay, let me see. It's Agent Impola and Chambers. I think it's on 16. It might be on page 16. There's asterisks all across it. And it has Special Agent Impola and Special Agent Chambers, May 31st of 2020. Oh, uh, okay. I see it. And could you read what it says right there? And this is a recorded statement. So this is um, the statement we just read from Dan Chapel, or that audio where he's saying we're putting a timeline on it. That was from May 14th. This is May 31st, 2020. Special Agent Impola and Special Agent Chambers yeah we could if there was an actual plan we could make it happen but you know we can't make a plan until paul makes a plan right so these are the actual agents saying that they can make it happen 
whatever it is that that's in their mind, they could make it happen. But you can't make a plan until Paul makes a plan, right? Right. And that's as of May 31st. Now, there's also notes on one of the items that Stan Chapel asking if the FBI is wasting his time. I forget exactly which one that is. Right. Here is May 31st, so the same day as um, the FBI acknowledging there's no plan and, oh, we could make a plan. Um, right. Or we could make it happen. So here on the 31st, CHS Dan says, right, but yeah, and I keep trying to push. Right. Press on them. Where are you guys wanting to go with this? Because I'm wanting to know, are you wasting my time? So right. he admits right there, he's the one pushing. He's pushing, right. He's pushing. And pressing now, them. Right. Now, keep in mind, that's Dan Chapel, okay? And that's in May as he's working on this group, the Wolverine Watchmen. Now, Adam Fox is not a member of the Wolverine Watchmen. So as you'll flip over to either page 16 or 18, you'll see where Dan Chapel makes initial contact with Adam Fox on social media. Okay. As many of you know, I'm currently working on a documentary on that case. It's called Kidnap and Kill an FBI Terror Plot. I was working with and interviewing two of the defendants in that case. Those men were currently being held at Nuego County uh, while I was conducting interviews with them for the documentary. The government became aware of their participation in the documentary. Uh, the, one of the U.S. attorneys ended up quoting um, one of the interviews I conducted with Barry Croft at his sentencing hearing. Um, you know, is a way to, to kind of punish him and, uh, you know, what appeared to me to be some kind of bizarre retaliation. Uh, that was the first indication I got that maybe we're definitely, you know, maybe we're onto something here with this documentary. Maybe that we're, we're getting into things and we're touching on things that the government really doesn't want us to touch on. And I felt like them mentioning the documentary and quoting the, one of the interviews that Barry did to call him, you know, an unrepentant and completely radicalized, right? Because he's telling the truth about how he was framed and set up by the FBI. Um, that there's something there that they're so terrified about the public seeing that the government felt the need to intervene, not only to punish Barry and give him a harsher sentence for his participation in the documentary, but then uh, after that, you know, I continued to interview both Adam and Barry, and I got them to uh, come up with a statement to the weaponization subcommittee that if they could get a statement to the committee who has who was formed to investigate and look into uh, abuses by government agencies, you know, the weaponization of the federal government and the politicization of it. Uh, this is this case, of course, is a perfect example of that. And um, while both Adam and Barry are currently appealing what is happening to them in their sentences, uh, they don't really have a lot of faith in the appeals process. So they believe that their best hope was getting the uh, committee, the weaponization committee, to look into what the FBI did in this case. Uh, which was just egregious. Um, entrapment is illegal. Framing people for something they didn't do, you're not allowed to do that. It's unacceptable. So we had just finished filming their statements for the weaponization committee. I had um, released them on my YouTube channel. Uh, a news article was written about it, uh, talking about the statement that was made uh, to the committee, and then boom, the next day, they're moved to supermax prisons, and the government says, okay, we really got to silence them and shut them down. We can't have these guys making statements to the weaponization committee. We can't have these guys letting government officials know. We can't have them letting the politicians and the American public know what happened to them and that we've, you know, set this whole thing up. Oh, no, we can't have people finding finding out about that we can't have these guys recording statements for this committee you know we can't have the chance uh we don't want to risk the chance of the weaponization committee 
opening an investigation into our conduct in this case because, you know, oh no, then some of us might be uh, held accountable for our crimes. And so what's happened is by moving these guys to these Supermax facilities, they are preventing them from being able to participate in the documentary with me, but moreover, there are families affected by this too. It's not just the guys that were entrapped and framed by the federal government who are affected by this. It is their families as well. They bear the financial burden of paying, you know, for commissary for the phone calls. Prison phone calls are super expensive. By the way, it is five minutes for a 15 minute phone call. And where these guys are going, they're probably going to be held in 23 hour a day isolation and pro probably only allowed to have one 15 minute phone call per month, which they're obviously not going to give to me, the person working on a documentary on their story. They're obviously going to want to contact family and loved ones with the limited time that they're gonna get. So what's happened here though, is that the government is terrified of a documentary by me, myself. I don't have a team of people. I, I'm not a professional, I'm an independent journalist. This is my first time doing a documentary. I have an editor and that's it. It's just us. And so what, what we've learned is how powerful we are as people, how powerful you, the listener right now listening are. You have the power to terrify the federal government just by virtue of your existing, your supporting my work, your support of my documentary has them terrified to the point where they are taking action. They are making moves to actively try to shut down the documentary to make it impossible for me to finish my job. Well, to try to intimidate me also, by the way, and uh, I'm on to you, you know, <laughs> these things don't work. I see what you're trying to do. You don't scare me. Uh, you're out of control. Someone needs to be watching and investigating you and holding you accountable. When I say you, I'm speaking to the federal government. Someone needs, there needs to be a watchdog on you. That's where we're at now. And so I will continue to do that in this case. I will continue to investigate and bring the truth to the people about what happened in this case, why it's so egregious, uh, how this is still an ongoing issue. Um, and really, we're not going to stop fighting, number one, until we get the documentary out, completed, for everyone to see the truth. We're, we're going to make sure that happens. We are going to push and push until we get the funding we need to complete this. Um, and then we're going to bring that film to everybody. And we're going to present it to the FBI and we're going to ask them, what is your response? What are you going to do about it? You know, what are you going to do about this? <laughs> so anyways, yeah, we, I'm not going to be silenced though. I'm not going to be intimidated. You're not going to shut down my documentary, which I have the right to make. So uh, if you agree with me and you don't think that the government has the right to try to interfere in journalism, donate if you can if you can afford to to the documentary so we can get this done and show them that we don't give up when things get difficult uh, we put our faith in the lord and we do his will and um, we do the right thing and that's what i seek to do with this documentary is to do the right thing to be a voice for people who haven't had a voice throughout this entire process um, and we want to be that voice for them and their families. Uh, so anyways, that's where we're at right now. The FBI is terrified of a small-time YouTuber and independent journalist, first-time documentary filmmaker. They are terrified of the American people seeing how inept, incompetent, and corrupt they are, how they've become completely politicized and weaponized, how they knowingly uh, frame innocent people for things they didn't do to advance their own careers and their own ability to make money. These people are so corrupt and, you know, their corruption is so obvious too uh, that they feel the need, you know, to go after somebody like myself or to shut down Adam and Barry from being able to speak to the public 
if these guys are guilty, as the government says, then why do you need to silence them? Why do you need to hide all of the discovery and keep everything under seal in the federal case, in the state case? You know, why all the secrecy? It doesn't make sense. It makes sense if you're hiding the crime scene, which is what it is. It's the government's crime scene. So, uh, anyways, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be embarrassed. And we're, we are going to work hard. We're going to try to get the documentary done. Uh, hopefully by the end of the year. We're in March now. If we can meet our fundraising goal by December, we can get the documentary completed. But it is a big goal. Uh, we have, you know, we need a certain amount of money to complete the film. I think that we can raise that money. Uh, I'm hoping you guys can help me help share this video, spread the word about what's going on with this case and help us talk about the documentary and get other people to cover it because it is so important. You can send the government a message though that we're not gonna be silenced, we're not gonna be intimidated and we're not gonna put up with your lies and corruption and your filth and degeneracy anymore by donating to the documentary, Kidnap and Kill, an FBI terror plot. You can help us bring accountability and transparency to the FBI, help us expose their crimes in this case, and help us get justice for innocent people who not only have they been affected, but their entire families have been affected by this. So anyways, uh, thank you guys so much for everything, for your support. If you have donated to the documentary, thank you so much. If you do donate to the documentary, uh, anybody that donates $500 or more, we will include your name uh, in the credits to the documentary. So there's that incentive to donate to the documentary. Anyways, thank you guys so much. I hope you all have a good day.